Good day to everyone. My name is William Brady. I'm from the University of Virginia, and we're going to talk about wide complex tachycardia. Today's lecture is part two of a three part series. If you have not seen part one, you can certainly access it through the course description or search it uh, on your own. And we'd be very happy to see you in part one. And of course, there's going to be a part three as well. In part two, we're going to talk about making the distinction between VT versus SVT with aberrant conduction and talk very briefly about some of the pre existing clinical decision rules. So, making the distinction. First and foremost, is it always possible? Not necessarily. Okay? There are definitely situations where you have a rapid, regular, or irregular wide complex rhythm. And despite your ability to read the ECG and be very comfortable with that approach, you may not come up with a definitive rhythm diagnosis. And that is totally fine. That does not mean you are an inadequate clinician. That does not mean that you're practicing poor medicine in any way. Okay? Sometimes you can't make the rhythm diagnosis. Okay? You need to treat the patient and the ECG, not just the ECG. So a very important take home point. So how do we make the distinction, if we can, between VT versus SVT with aberrant conduction and our wide complex tachycardia patient before our eyes? Well, there's some clinical information that can be helpful. None of the information on this page, however, is definitive and will tell you one way or the other what the rhythm is. It is one piece of the puzzle. It is one slice of the pie that you can put together with the rest of the puzzle or the rest of the pie to come to the best diagnosis possible. But these two points, age and past medical history, are worth mentioning. First of all, we know as a person gets older, they have an increasing chance of developing heart disease, particularly a heart disease involving the left ventricle, whether it's poorly treated hypertension, heart failure from a range of sources, past myocardial infarction, any of those sorts of issues, these patients tend to get older and tend to develop heart disease, and they can develop VT. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone age 50.1 years and above who has a wide complex tachycardia has VTAC, and everyone that's 49 years and below has SVT with aberrant conduction. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that VT tends to occur in older people, while SVT with aberrant conduction tends to occur in younger people. But we have all seen VT in people less than age 50, and we have definitely seen SVT with aberrant conduction in people over the age of 50. So it's one piece of the puzzle, keep that in mind. Pest medical history is important. As we mentioned in one of the examples of SVT with aberrant conduction in part one, if a patient has a past history of congenital heart disease, particularly with surgical correction, remember that produces a bundle branch block pattern, and that could certainly favor an SVT with aberrant conduction diagnosis. On the other hand, someone with multivessel coronary disease, stented or not, past myocardial infarction, or chronic significant heart failure, any of those diagnoses favor VT. And why is that? Well, again, as we referred to earlier in the age category, VT tends to occur in the setting of chronically or acutely ill left ventricles. And multivessel coronary disease, past myocardial infarction, significant chronic heart, heart failure are all different forms of chronic left ventricular disease. Okay? So again, age and past medical history are not conclusive by themselves, but they are pieces of the puzzle that you can use. So let's just say we have a 65-year-old male with a past history of MI, several stents in place within his coronary anatomy, who also has chronic heart failure. So this is an older man with a chronically ill left ventricle. He certainly could have VT, but he could also have SVT with aberrant conduction. So we're going to have to look at the electric cardiogram. Now, one important point to make, symptoms and signs are not particularly helpful in making the distinction between VT and SVT of aberrant conduction. 
many cardiologists that are very gifted in auscultation of the heart and other physical exam maneuvers can use the presence of certain pressure waves in the neck and certain osculatory findings listening to the heart to perhaps discern one type of rhythm category from the other. But that's very challenging, and I think most of the rest of us are not particularly successful with that. So various physical findings are not helpful, even including blood pressure. Many people incorrectly think that if the patient's hypotensive, the wide complex tachycardia has to be VT. But if they're normotensive, the wide complex tachycardia has to be SVT with aberrant conduction. And that is false in both accounts. You can have people with VTAC and a compensated blood pressure, meaning they're not hypotensive. And you can have people with SVT with aberrant conduction who are in shock with hypotension. So signs are not helpful, including vital signs. And the same is true of symptoms. You can have people that have chest pain, they're dizzy, they've had a syncopal episode, a bunch of other very concerning symptoms on presentation, and they can really have either rhythm presentation. And you can have people that are minimally bothered, only presenting with palpitations or my heart is beating fast, and they can be in either rhythm presentation. So real important take home message here is symptoms and signs are not helpful in discerning one from the other. Now, as we mentioned, we're going to have to look at the electrocardiogram, and that's okay. There's several things that you can look at, some of value, some of limited value, and some of significant value. So let's go and start with rate. Rate isn't very helpful, okay? SVT with aberrancy tends to be a little faster than VT, but look at the overlap, okay? 130 to 190 for VT. And for SVT with aberrant conduction, 160 to 220. There's way too much overlap there, so there's no way to make a distinction between the two rhythm categories strictly based on rate. Regularity can be helpful, but only when irregularity is noted. VT tends to be very regular, and many forms of SVT with aberrant conduction also tend to be regular. There are a couple forms of irregular SVTs, such as atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. MAT can be and frequently is irregular. So when you have a rapid, wide, irregular, irregular rhythm, it's highly likely atrial fibrillation with bundle branch block. Other considerations about regularity are not helpful. Now, one finding is very helpful and that's AV dissociation, okay? Atrioventricular dissociation. And just what does that mean? Well, when a patient goes into VTAC, as we see here, we have a focus in the ventricle firing off, producing depolarization within the ventricle. In fact, ventricular tachycardia. And on the electrocardiogram, we see, we see a rapid, regular, wide, complex rhythm. But just because the VT focus is firing off doesn't mean that the SA node turns itself off. In fact, many times, if not most times during VT, the SA node continues to depolarize and sends the depolarization wave throughout atrial tissues, causing atrial depolarization and the P wave on the electrocardiogram. On occasion, you can see small deflections that look just like a P wave because, in fact, they are P waves. Okay. In the setting of a rapid, regular, wide, complex tachycardia, the appearance of AV dissociation strongly favors the diagnosis of VT. The medical literature tells us this is less common. I, I would actually disagree with that. I don't think it's very common, but if you know what you're looking for and have the patience to look for it on a monitor, you may see this more often than less common. And again, when you see it, it strongly favors the diagnosis of VTAC. So it's definitely worth knowing about and looking for. Here's a, a 12 lead ECG showing evidence of AV dissociation. Again, in several areas, there are more examples than I've pointed out with the arrows. In fact, multiple areas where we see uh, evidence of small P waves. Okay, this is AV dissociation in a otherwise wide complex tachycardia.
appearance or presence of the AV dissociation strongly suggests that this is ventricular tachycardia. Now, two other findings that are also worth understanding and looking for because they strongly suggest VT are the so-called fusion and capture beats. Again, looking at our heart here, when we have a patient going into ventricular tachycardia, a focus here in the ventricle, firing off, depolarizing, causing the ventricular dysrhythmia. Remember we said the SA node doesn't shut down or stop working. In fact, it continues. And we have depolarization of the atrial tissues and the impulse then moves to the AV node, okay? And then can move through the AV node into the ventricle and move down through the ventricular myocardium using the bundle branches. Now, a fusion beat occurs when you have the VT focus firing off, producing a depolarization wave through the ventricle. At the same time, a supraventricular impulse has made its way through the AV node into the bundle branches, and that depolarization wave fuses with the VT focus depolarization wave, producing a QRS complex that is intermediate in width. And here's an example of the fusion beat. We have rapid, regular, wide complexes that look for all intents and purposes like VT. And then we have this QRS complex here occurring in the middle all by itself. It's not narrow, it's not normal in appearance, but it's not wide like these other uh, complexes. So this is a fusion of the supraventricular impulse and the ventricular impulse into a somewhat intermediate with appearing QRS. That's a fusion beat. Now, a capture beat is the same process, except it goes a step further, where the results entirely from the supraventricular impulse that makes its way through the AV node into the bund bundle branches and causes ventricular depolarization nanoseconds before the ventricular focus is able to cause depolarization. And that results in a narrow QRS complex. So here, when you look closely, there's a P wave, a QRS, and a T wave in the setting of these otherwise rapid, regular, wide, complex uh, rhythm examples. Okay, so this is a capture beat where the SA node has captured the ventricle for this one beat. The presence of either of these strongly favors VT. Again, the literature says these are less common. I disagree with that, only in that if you know what you're looking for and have the patience to look for them, you will see them more often than not. And again, they're worth looking for because when you see it, you will be able to diagnose VT to a very high degree of certainty. Here's a multi-channel rhythm strip from our emergency department several years ago that captured both, okay? A rapid, regular, wide, complex rhythm in a 70-some-year-old person with a very chronically ill left ventricle who has both capture beats, these narrow QRSs, and fusion beats, these intermediate width QRS complexes, really in, in one small sampling. So knowing what to look for, you see these, and you can diagnose this rhythm quite reliably. So again, capture and fusion beats are very worthwhile, definitely worth knowing about, and definitely worth using. There are features of the QRS complex that are helpful, and there are features of the QRS complex that are less helpful. One of the features of the QRS complex that is very helpful is the concept of precordial concordance. And just what does that mean? Precordial concordance means that we're looking at V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. In other words, all the precordial leads, V1 through V6, and looking at the polarity of the QRS complexes. Polarity means positive or negative, okay? Precordial concordance means that all or most of the QRS complexes are either positive or negative. So if they're all or mostly all positive, it is positive concordance, and that's very frequently VT, okay? If the QRS complexes are entirely negative or almost entirely all negative, then that's negative concordance, 
And that is, quote, always VT, unquote. So here's examples of both positive concordance, V1, V2, V3, all the way to V6, where the curious complexes are mostly or entirely positive. Down below is negative, where the curious complexes are entirely negative across the precordium V1 through V6. So electrocardiograms, 12 lead ECG showing this, where we have positive concordance, entirely positive QRS complexes from V1 to V6, and entirely negative QRS complexes from V1 to V6, positive concordance and negative concordance. When we see this, it's very helpful because it strongly suggests VT in either of those. And so why does this make a difference? Why is this important? Well, remember, if we have a supraventricular source of the rhythm, sinus tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, AVNRT, MAT, whatever, if it's supraventricular source, remember that the QRS complex normally is negative entirely or mostly in V1, mostly negative with a little bit of positivity in V2. Then when you get to V3, V4, we begin to transition from mostly negative to maybe half and half positive and negative. V4, mostly positive. V5, almost entirely positive. And V6, entirely positive. Now this talks about normal R wave progression. Remember the R wave is the positive part of the QRS complex. And in V1, it's normal to have minimal to no R wave. And in V6, have almost an en entire R wave of the QRS complex, meaning you go from a negatively oriented to a positively oriented QRS complex. And that suggests that we have a supraventricular source. And here's a patient that illustrates that quite well. Here is a patient who, in sinus rhythm, has a negative QRS in V1, all the way transitioning to a positive QRS in V6. He then, over time, develops a left bundle branch block pattern, okay? Still superventricular, this is still sinus rhythm. His QRS complex is still mostly negative in V1, a little positive in V2, and then V3, V4 is the transition from negative to positive. V5 and V6 are entirely positive. So he's gone from a negative QRS to a positive QRS. Well, if we have a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrant conduction, we're gonna highly likely have this negative QRS in V1 all the way out to a positive QRS in V6. On the other hand, if we have ventricular tachycardia, we may have positive concordance, where all the QRSs are positive, or negative concordance, where all the QRSs are negative. You definitely don't see this in all cases of VT, but when you do see either of these, it is a strong suggestion that you have ventricular tachycardia. So another finding worth knowing. Now, warning, danger warning. The other features of the QRS complex can be problematic. Width, axis, morphology, contour, combinations of these features. These we'll see in the upcoming slides are certainly useful for certain practitioners like the electrophysiologist and, and other types of cardiologists, but for people that really don't do that type of work every single day, probably not as helpful. And so here really are the five best known, most widely quoted diagnostic algorithms or clinical decision rules that attempt to differentiate VT from SVT with aberrant conduction. Going back to 1978, Wellens criteria, Kindwald 10 years later in 1988, a couple years later, the Brugada algorithm that we've all heard about, Varecki in 2007, 2008, and Becker in 2011. Okay. Really, when you compare these algorithms over time, and this is actually a very well done study that looked at the diagnostic accuracy, inner rate of reliability, et cetera, et cetera, of these five decision rules, they really found that older rules and more contemporary newer rules didn't work any differently. In other words, the diagnostic accuracy 
really wasn't there, not particularly sensitive nor specific, and a fair amount of interrelator difference, which means that when you use it and I use it, we're likely more likely to come to a different conclusion. When you have a low rate of interrater variation, that means that most clinicians using the same rule on the same ECG are going to come to the same conclusion, which is what you want. That tells us that it is easily applied, easily understood, and accurate. And in fact, we don't find that with these. Okay, Certainly developed by experts and certainly of value in certain rhythm specialists. But I think for people that are really, frankly, not cardiologists, specifically electrophysiologists, not as helpful. And there's actually a range of issues in these clinical decision rules. First of all, very few of them had SVT with aberrant conduction in them when they were being developed. In other words, when the studies were being done, most of the patients were VT, okay? Most, if not all of these, were made by very capable, very smart cardiology practitioners, in fact, electrophysiologists, and they focused mostly on VT and had very few patients with SVT with aberrancy in, in this group, okay? So be careful and cautious. Another caution that's worth mentioning is that several of the rhythms, namely a great example is the Brugada algorithm, defaults to SVT with aberrant conduction. In other words, going through the four questions of the Brugada algorithm, if you get to the end of that algorithm and answer no, it defaults to the less severe diagnosis, SVT with aberrant conduction. And I strongly urge you to not do that. Remember, we should always assume the worst until we can prove otherwise. And any decision rule that def defaults to the less severe diagnosis or the less alarming diagnosis probably isn't the safest tool to be using, okay? Bottom line for all these rules, limited in diagnostic accuracy. So that's the end of part two. Thank you for attending. If you haven't seen part one, I would draw your attention to that. And of course, we're gonna put everything together in part three. Again, thank you for what you do. Stay safe and I will be seeing you.